There are three key issues in the race for Kentucky governor this year. Number one is jobs. Number two is jobs. Number three is jobs. The economy is on the minds of Kentucky voters. Three men think that they have the skills needed to lead the Commonwealth for the next four years. They are Democrat Steve Bashir, the incumbent, Republican David Williams, and Independent Gatewood Galbraith. Galbraith is a Lexington attorney who formerly owned a tractor company and has worked in automotive assembly, sales, and as a milkman. This is the fourth time he's run for governor. As a recent college graduate, myself and my friends have had trouble finding jobs. I was wondering what the plan is for you and your administration to create jobs and keep these young professionals here in the Commonwealth. Well, Shana, thanks for that question. It's, it's critical to the future of Kentucky. We lost 94,000 jobs in the last two years. The jobs that are here in Kentucky are moving out and we seem unable to attract jobs unless they're in the $8 an hour category, which we know you cannot subsist on. Uh, your future is in doubt at this point for jobs in Kentucky. In 1993, Gene Strong, the head of the Council for Economic Development, the people who give out tax incentives to locate jobs here in the state, said publicly, I have a plan for every Kentuckian. By the year 2012, 80% of Kentuckians are gonna be earning $8 an hour. So in essence, your generation has been thrown open to employment competition with people halfway around the world who work all day for a bowl of rice and a mat to sleep on. So what we decided was that if, unless we can raise our educational standards, we're not going to be able to attract the kinds of jobs that are above and beyond the $8 an hour category. So what we had devised is called the Commonwealth Incentive Plan. And what we want to do is to award every high school graduate in the state of Kentucky a $5,000 voucher for books, tuition, and fees to any institution of further learning that would train them into a state of employability. This time we start talking about further education for everybody, not just higher education for a few. And we need to train our C and D students into employability too, or else they're just gonna be a drag on us all. So what that ought to do, dear, is I hope that we'll attract job training and emerging industries into the state of Kentucky because we have a target audience we're going to pay them to train our workers to take, take jobs in that emerging industry or in these worker training programs. Uh, this money cannot be spent on any creature comfort, no pizza, rent, or beer. It's only for books, tuition, and fees. It can be for truck driving school, cosmetology school, UK, UL, Spencerian College, uh, and all of those uh, educational opportunities that are training them into employability. There's going to be a lot of people who are going to be more valuable for being able to fix a transmission or an air conditioner than who need an, an English uh, 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 master's in literature in English. So we hope that they bring in worker training and emerging industries into the state. We know that those will come to the rural counties too because they don't have to have a highly populous area in order to center their worker training. Every county is going to have a pool of graduating high school seniors with a $5,000 voucher in their pocket. The money has to be spent on books, tuition, and fees. It has to be spent in Kentucky. It has to be spent within the 10 years of, uh, of that uh, after they graduate to give these kids in these poor counties some vision beyond high school. Uh, besides the fact they don't have to go to school anymore, they can get a driver's license. It will give the high school diploma real value so that the dropout rate ought to be less. We ought to be able to strengthen the underlying curriculum on what it takes to earn a high school diploma. But just as importantly, it'll start refunding education, which is what we need to do to attract the jobs you're talking about. And what we're talking about here, we're talking about high school graduates, but that ought to lift the economic, uh, the economic waters to help our college graduates at the time because there'll be people who need to be trained in things. And uh, not one dollar gets spent until that person presents themselves there to be their training. In 1991, when I ran for, 1995 when I ran for governor, we spent 68% of the budget on education. This year we're spending 58% of the budget on education. So this is a way of refunding the educational budget, except we put it directly in the hands of the people who need to be educated. It's not like spending $100 million on a building and trying to entice people into the curriculum. This is directly spent by the person who needs to be trained in the direction they want to be trained in, and that first dollar doesn't get spent until they present themselves to, there to begin the training. So we can afford to do this. We can cut the corruption. We can afford to do this. We can pay for this. Additionally, from the educational standpoint, I want to give every eighth grader in the state of Kentucky uh, a, a laptop computer that they can take home. It's theirs. 
uh, you know, they can teach their family, they can teach their siblings. It will enrich the educational environment in every household where there's a child in the state of Kentucky. We need to lift ourselves, our children, and you folks into the new world economy. We do that by opening up as much technological uh, uh, doors as we can, Wi-Fi the state, cut college, uh, freeze tuition uh, at colleges, and do all the kinds of things to flood money into the educational environment that will create jobs while we educate the people. There are currently over 200,000 Kentuckians unemployed, many here in northern Kentucky. One way to solve that problem would be to reinvigorate our airport to create more jobs. How will you take steps to do that? Well, Mike, thanks for the question. Um, I am absolutely uninformed on efforts to expand the airport in, uh, in Cincinnati or up here in northern Kentucky. However, I understand that that is today's highway and that we all know that more roads create better job and job opportunities. And so I'm going to take it at face value uh, that, uh, that what you're saying is, can be done, is being talked about, and would be an economic stimulus for this area. I've got to tell you, brother, I'm afraid that the state is broke. And that we're broke because of the corruption of the past administrations that have taken every spare dollar uh, that, uh, that the benefits of the labor of the working men and women in small business in this state and paid them out to big corporate special interests instead of put to work for the people. So what I hope that we can do, Mike, is I hope we can stem the corruption that's been bleeding the dollar out of the hands of the taxpayer and into the hands of special interests and start putting it to work for the people. We're not going to be able to do that without a consortium of concerned and intelligent people. Uh, if what you're saying is true, then we ought to put together a committee to see how we could possibly fund that. Uh, we're going to look for new directions for funding. We're going to ask uh, that the tax structure be revamped. We're going, to, we're going to practice a return on investment strategy here in the state. We're not going to be giving out money to people to have them spend it willy-nilly. If we're going to be awarding any money or spending any money, on behalf of the state, we want to return on the investment. That is, we want to see actual uh, steps of, of improvement taken or actual economic dollars stimulated. Um, we're totally committed to making Kentucky a business-friendly uh, business friendly place. I hope we can get in the industry and the, uh, uh, the, those people who utilize the uh, air uh, for their commercial commerce, try to invite those people in on a business-friendly basis. Uh, we are totally business friendly ticket for this governor's race. As the owner of a coffee shop, I want to continue to serve my community for many years to come. What I want to know is how you can improve the business climate, specifically lessening the tax burden on businesses like mine. Dear, there's no doubt about it that small business and the wage earner in this state had been carrying the burden for too long. As a matter of fact, they hadn't been able to keep pace with it because the state of Kentucky is now $38 billion in debt. We're so bad off that the bank accounts of the state have been removed from Frankfurt and given over to Chase Manhattan in New York, who are now working the books for Kentucky. So uh, how are we going to do it? We're going to have to revamp the tax structure. We're going to have to make this a consumer tax base, a consumption tax base, rather than an earning base. Uh, the people who make uh, small business and, uh, and the wage earner who make a profit ought to be able to keep the results of that effort. And if they're going to pay taxes, they need to pay it and they're buying something when they're spending something retail. Uh, we, I'd like to tax services. I'd like to eliminate the income tax for anybody earning less than $50,000 a year and any small business earning less than $250,000 a year. I'd love to eliminate those. I think we can do that without raising the consumption tax above the 6% level, 6 cent level. Uh, I'm an attorney, I don't mind taxing myself because I think that we ought to share more of the burden of it. Uh, small business, of course, is the, uh, is the mother's milk of uh, job opportunity. Um, I've owned several small businesses myself. Uh, I don't have any big business special interest contributors to the campaign. So um, I am all about decentralizing employment uh, individual opportunity, the American dream, work for yourself, be self-determinative, be sovereign in your decision making, and I'm going to try to get government off your back and free you up to be the very best you can be. The majority of NKU's budget comes from student tuition because state funding is proportionally less than other state schools. What plans do you have to help bring this into balance? 
Well, first of all, we're going to freeze all the tuitions at every university. So they're pricing education out of the hands of, the, uh, of everybody. <laughs> you know, even folks who are pretty well off are having, uh, finding it difficult uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, pay for cost of education. And student loans have, uh, have been for a long time an anathema to the future of, of students. Uh, you know, the uh, people coming out and graduating uh, with thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars in student loans, they're finding jobs at eight dollars an hour if they can find that. How are they going to pay off those student loans? You know, there goes their credit, they're, they're in debt up to their ears and uh, have to move in with mom or dad. Can't hardly afford their own place. They can't afford a car and insurance and gasoline and rent. Can't do that in eight bucks an hour. So it is a broad question for a lot of people, Dustin. Uh, what we would like to do is we would like to stop this capitalization on the universities. You know, the University of Kentucky has spent hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars in all kinds of new buildings and say they have another billion dollars worth of buildings they have to build. I doubt it. You know, this top 20 university uh, 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 brain fantasy of, of, of Lee Todd uh, were misdirected the University of Kentucky into thinking it had to be a, some sort of big brainy research institution when in fact it's a land-grant college designed to educate the students and that's where the money needs to be going back into. Affording access and affording education to as many of our students as possible and teaching them how to be useful members of society. It's like I said, you know, uh, people who can fix a, a, a transmission or uh, repair a, a, a heating vent are going to be far more valuable than people with masters in English lit. And so, you know, we're going to have to start taking a look at our education dollars spent, but mostly it needs to be spent to afford as much access to further education to all of our students as we could possibly afford it, instead of giving out that money to large special interest people who have been giving contributions to the major parties. State funding for school districts continues to decrease while the unfunded mandates of Senate Bill 1 continue to increase. How do you plan to support school districts with costs and resources needed to properly implement technology centers, teacher training, new standards, and a new accountability assessment system? That's just all politics, dear. I mean, as I say, in 1991, we spent 68% of the budget on education. This year, we're spending 58% of the budget on education. These people know what they're doing. They're defunding the apparatus necessary to try to get actual job of education done. Uh, what we would like to do is refund it, as I've talked about earlier in my uh, Commonwealth Incentive Program. That's not going to disturb the SEEK funds. It's not going to disturb the KEYS funds. Uh, we're going to try to free up money uh, and, and, and put it back into education. Um, I have talked about let me talk about where we're going to find money to do that. Uh, in, 19, in 1995, when Paul Patton took office, we had $280 billion in what's called personal service contracts. That is where the state it pays private industries and private corporations to do work for the state. Work that the state might be able to do, but these are private individuals who the state say may be able to do it even better or cheaper. What that actually is, is the payoffs to the private individuals who give the, the contributions into the uh, political races for the winners. In 1995, that was uh, $280 million. This year, it's $2 billion. $2 billion that your tax dollars go out to pay private industry to do state work that we might have state workers can do it themselves. This is why 90% of the money being given to Steve Bashir for his reelection comes from people who do business with the state. They're expecting 10 to 100 times back what it is than they gave over to him. So what we're going to do is, is I don't I owe those kinds of debts. I think that we can take a billion dollars of that without affecting the services that we need to hire from outside help. I think we can take a billion dollars of that. I think we can use that money to finally try to fund the necessary steps. I don't know if, Senate, I don't know if uh, uh, Bill 1 is going to uh, uh, solve any problems. I wasn't there when it was passed. I do know this, that we put too much of an administrative load on the teachers and they no longer had the actual real time to give that kid a hug when they come in there, you know, to pat them on the head and tell them that they're, that they're good kids, to acknowledge and affirm them. My mother was a master teacher and there was not a kid who came into that classroom who needed a hug that day that didn't get it. And so, uh, you know, uh, third grade, I mean, acknowledge and affirm the kids. And for gosh sakes, 
let's make sure that they have the proper textbooks to take home and to uh, and, and give them the proper tools and give the, st the teachers proper tools. We've got enough tax dollars to do it. We just need to divert it down into people's needs instead of corporate needs. In the times that we're living in, we're seeing a substantial increase in need. Our food pantry, benevolence requests, people without a job, all those things are increasing. What are some things that you're going to do to help us expand the opportunities for those who are in need? Reverend Meekham, that's a very timely question. Uh, first of all, my running mate, D. Riley, uh, helped the state formulate several faith-based initiatives uh, back uh, when uh, Mr. Fletcher was governor of the state of Kentucky. Uh, she, uh, by the way, uh, she is a mother of six, uh, two adopted, one of her natural children is special needs. So we know where rubber meets the road on women and children's issues. All along, I've said that we are a human society, not a corporate society. All along, I said that the human beings need their needs taken care of before the corporations do. So uh, what we're going to try, uh, sir, is to stop being a burden on the people. My view of government is to uplift, enlighten, educate, ennoble, and empower every individual. My view of the individual is that they're all sovereign human beings endowed by our creator with inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I'd like to stop spending money on corporate and, and profit-based uh, burdens that are put on the people. I'd like to stop putting so many of them in jail for their own uh, personal problems. I'd like to take that money and start going over to the social services into trying to solve the, uh, we're never going to solve it, we're trying to treat the causes of homelessness and causes of despair, uh, you know, and, but the government can't do that. The government can't do that. The government can maybe clear the way for people, involve people, especially it seemed to be centered in faith-based uh, concerns such as the churches and uh, the uh, other uh, service clubs like the Rotarians and the Lions and those people. Uh, I think that we should all sit down at the table and put, uh, put everything on the table that we can, see how we can take care of the infrastructure needs in the state of Kentucky, and at the same time take care of those who need it most, and those are the voiceless, the homeless, and the powerless. If I vote for you, can you tell me, after your first year in office, what changes I will see in the state of Kentucky that will make my life better? Consuela, I don't see who you're working for. I don't know whether you're a state employee or a private employee. Uh, but uh, we're going to try. We probably can't do it the first year. We're going to have to put a, a panel of true experts together to rewrite the tax code to try to make sure that you can keep everything that you earn in your paycheck and no income tax from the state of Kentucky comes out. That's one of the things I'd like to see happen. Another thing I'd like to see happen is for uh, the uh, women and children's issue of the state of Kentucky. I don't know if you have any children, but I would like to see uh, the, our plans for education take forth to where your children will have an opportunity to be trained into employability no matter what direction they want to go in. If you have a person, a, 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 an eighth grader or something like that, we hope to have a laptop computer in their, in their, in their lap so that they can uh, step to the forefront in opportunity and technological education. Um, I believe that, uh, that after the first year, you're going to notice a change in attitude because we want to change the attitude of, from uh, us versus them to we the people. Uh, government shouldn't be an onus. It shouldn't be a burden on us. Uh, it should be a helpful provider when we need it. Otherwise, it should get out of our way and uh, stop interfering with our pursuit of life, liberty, and happiness. So a general attitude, a general attitude change. The biggest thing, our first line that we want to get done is to restore integrity and trust in the process itself. Because so many good-minded people won't even touch the political process in this state because it's so mean-spirited and corrupt and vituperative. They don't even want to be a part of the solution or try to be. We want to open up the system so good-minded people who want to get done what needs to be done won't be afraid to take part in being the solution. National health care reform has fundamentally changed the way that health care is delivered. But with those changes have come unfunded mandates as the federal government pushes down expenses to the state levels. Are you willing to accept those changes? Or are you wanting to fight back? I want to fight back. I'm so tired of government interfering in the natural process of the, of the economy. You know, uh, back in 95 when uh, uh, Brereton, or 91 when Brereton won 
uh, governor of the state of Kentucky, we lost about 95% of the health care insurance companies in this state. And so what I would like to do is see if the, if the natural marketplace won't solve a lot of the problems we're creating for ourselves. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to uh, I would like to invite in every health care insurance company in the world to come in here and compete with each other to try to sell us the lowest care policy, the, the lowest cost policy, health care policy we could possibly get. Uh, if we have any kind of in, uh, insured policy, uh, maybe a, a catastrophic policy uh, that would cover most everybody, maybe the cost of that would be subsidized. But otherwise, have a fairly high, uh, have a fairly high copay uh, so that the hangnails won't be taken to the uh, uh, taken to the emergency room, but see if we can't lower the cost of health care. I want to fully fund the county health departments because they are the safety net for the poor. Uh, you know, if you've got something minor, you don't know what it is. Instead of going to the hospital, uh, you can take in your poor. You don't you don't have the the uh, health insurance. Uh, don't have the copay. You don't want to know how to do it. You go to the health department. Let them triage it. If it takes hospital, then that's when you go to the hospital after it's been triaged. Otherwise, the county health department. Need to take care of it with shot. Uh, they they do so good as far as preventative health care education, and so uh, I want to see if we can get the natural market in it rather than have a big brother government and a nanny state. I don't want socialized medicine. Uh, I, I I just don't see it. Uh, uh, there there are ways we can cover the safety net, uh, but having the federal government telling us uh, you know what we can and cannot do with our uh, with our health care, I think is. Um, is I th it's socialized medicine, and I'm against it. The Brent Spence Bridge needs replacing, but funding is stalled. What are your thoughts on turning it into a toll bridge or private public financing? What are your thoughts on that? Dear, you know, Mark Twain said, everybody's ignorant just about different things. Uh, so what I would do is I would try to turn that over to a panel of experts who would tell us the best way to do it at the least cost to the most people. Uh, I don't have an answer for everything. I know that our infrastructure has been ignored for a long time. Uh, it, along with Medicaid, uh, teachers' retirement, pension funds, and education have been shortchanged and money diverted from those over to, uh, over to the special interest. And I know that infrastructure has suffered just as much. Uh, of course, there are bridge issues all over the state of Kentucky in Louisville and Northern Kentucky also. It needs to be a public-private consortium, dear. Uh, you know, there's no one who can do it all themselves. Uh, I hate to think that it would have to be a toll bridge. I, I don't want tolls. Uh, that hits the working people the hardest. Uh, and uh, I think, a, uh, on the other hand, the argument that people who use it ought to be the one that pays for it. I would have to say that that bridge is, is a benefit to all of Kentucky. And uh, so I would seek to, uh, seek to keep a toll off of the shoulders of the people if we could find some other way to do it. If there's no other way to ensure the safety of that structure and other infrastructures, then a toll is going to have to be the answer. Traditionally, new construction has led both the downturn and the recovery in our economy. For the last five and a half years, new construction has been in recession. What is your plan to rid the Commonwealth of the unfair and undervalued competition of the repossessed and short sale homes? Gee whiz, brother. Uh, you know, if I had to answer that, I'd be in Washington, D.C. instead of running for governor here. I do know this, that in the, uh, a, a little while earlier, I, I answered a question by telling you that the planned economic development plan for the state of Kentucky, it was such that in 1993, Gene Strong, head of the Council for Economic Development, said publicly, I have a plan for every Kentuckian. By the year 2012, 80% of Kentuckians are going to be earning $8 an hour. So that describes a, almost a generation of young folks who should be out there earning thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 a year and looking for that first home to buy where they're living with their parents because they can't do it on $8 an hour. And that, that they can't do it even if they didn't have a car and the insurance and gasoline and all that, they still can't do it on $8 an hour. So the market is weak right now and I don't see it getting a lot better, my friend. Uh, but the, uh, so, uh, you know, at eight dollars an hour, if they can't buy the houses, there goes the carpenters' work, and there goes the can't buy the cars, there goes the auto workers' work, and there goes another base that you all would generally have as far as middle class home buyers for for the new construction. I don't know what the answer is. They, you know, these people, I, I believe it's all a part to try to break us down to a third world economy. 
I believe that the people, the people who are in charge of this knew saw this coming. They've got computers that will process a billion bytes of information a second. They saw this coming. They're breaking down the American economy. They're breaking down the, the American way of life. That's why the people out there on Occupy Wall Street and the people out there in the Tea Party are taken to the streets because right in front of them the whole American dream is being demoralized by the big special interests who, uh, who are in control of our economy and in control of our policies. And I don't mean to be conspiratorial, uh, but there are people that I call the petrochemical, pharmaceutical, military, industrial, transnational, corporate, fascist, elite folks, who uh, people in transnational corporations who are setting economic and personal policy in the, state, in, in the United States of America, who've never said the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America or to the republic for which it stands. And they see the Constitution and the Bill of Rights as impediments to the implementation of a new world order and global economy. And uh, those people with their views on trying to make it a, a flat earth uh, and, and taking our children down to economic competition with people halfway world, around the world who work all day for a bowl of rice and mats to sleep on. What you're doing is you're, you're riding one of the uh, industries that are going to pay the price for it. And we're going to try to, it, we're going to, try to invigorate the state of Kentucky's economy so that we can eat up that surplus, so that we can get back to a common and, and a strong situation. But I guarantee you one thing, we're not going to do it if we keep on electing people from saying both parties who sold out me and you and all of us a long time ago. There's been much discussion and debate about raising the dropout age in Kentucky to 18. As a school superintendent, I do support this concept. However, we must realize that school districts cannot endure another unfunded mandate. What do you propose to financially support raising the dropout age to 18, and how are you going to support providing alternative and innovative programs for students that cannot be successful in a regular high school environment? Well, dear, that's a good question because I was one of those students. That was the kind of age where uh, I uh, was about as far amiss as a young man can be. And uh, I am against raising the dropout age to 18. Because uh, I, I remember what it was like for me sitting in school when I didn't want to be there. I was disruptive. I, uh, I was truant, uh, you know. And I should have been—I uh, probably should have uh, gone into the military at an early age. I didn't do that until I was 19. Uh, but, but here's the way I view it, dear. I've talked earlier about my Commonwealth incentive, where I want to give every high school graduate in the state of Kentucky a reward them with a $5,000 voucher for books, tuition, and fees to any institution of further learning in the state of Kentucky that will train them into employability. It's time that we start talking about training everybody into further education, not just higher education for a few. If we don't train our C&D students, generally the most dissatisfied folks in school, uh, you know, into employability, that they're going to be a drag on us all. This $5,000 voucher is not for, not for pizza, rent, or beer. It's strictly books, tuition, and fees. Uh, it's got to be spent in Kentucky. It ought to invite in worker training programs and, uh, and emerging industries into the state because we will pay them to train our workers to take part in that industry. And it ought to, uh, it, it ought to interest a lot of people staying in school voluntarily because that high school diploma will have a worth, a true value them besides the fact that they don't have to go to school anymore or that they, uh, you know, they uh, uh, can get a driver's license. So that uh, what that Commonwealth incentive does is, is it gives that a value. We ought to be able to strengthen the underlying curriculum that it takes to get that diploma because it is now a desirable object. <coughs> it will sponsor a lot of conversations in a lot of homes about some, what are you going to do with your voucher? you know, that would never have taken place because they didn't have anything, not even one square yard of sod to get traction on after high school. And the beautiful part of it does, it gives an opportunity to further education, pay for it, with the person who wants to be trained to pay for it in the direction they want to be trained in, but they don't pay for it until they actually start the training. It's not like buying a $100 million building and trying to entice people into the curriculum. Under our plan, it gets to start paying the first time when they, when they start their training. No pizza, rent, or beer, just books, tuition, and fees. So it's not going to be an answer for a lot of them. We're going to freeze tuitions. But it ought to give these kids a chance to think in terms of woodworking, uh, metalworking, uh, uh, heating and air conditioning, UK, UL, Spencerian College, any place that we can certify as training them into employability. I want to interest kids in further education. I don't want to 
I don't want to be a burden on them. I want to uplift them and empower them, educate them, ennoble them, and uh, let them see just where their brain can take them. We keep hearing about tax incentives and grants and investments being made to keep existing Kentucky businesses and bring new ones into the Commonwealth. However, there are smaller businesses that are struggling and don't want government assistance. What can be done to reduce the burden of government on these businesses? Well, first of all, uh, my friend, we're going to stop giving out tax incentives to businesses who locate $8 an hour jobs here in the state. I wasn't against Ark Park because of the uh, content of it. People can believe what they want to and pay to see what it is they want to see. But I am against giving out tax incentives to locate $8 jobs, uh, $1 an hour jobs here in the state because that's not even creating a, a taxable base. That's creating a working poor base that are going to end up on food stamps anyway. So that uh, what we would like to do is stop giving out your tax dollar for that. Since we lost 94,000 jobs in the state in the last two years, we'd like to offer any Kentucky existing corporation uh, some tax incentives to establish state-of-the-art environmental compliance around their business, no matter how big or small. That ought to stimulate the economy. It ought to clean up the environment. And uh, we uh, believe that they will anchor some of the jobs here and some of the smaller jobs businesses here because they feel like they have roots in the community and in the, in the environment itself. So uh, we, uh, uh, it's time that small business got a break. What we wanted to do is to uh, eliminate the state income tax for anybody earning less than 50000 a year and for small businesses earning less than 250000 a year. We recognize that small business are the biggest employers and the ones that, where the most jobs are, are created. So uh, we're going to try to free you all up and put some of this burden on the Lord, larger corporations and on some of these people who've been getting a free ride while you and the wage earner have been bearing the burden at the cost of government. NKU recently launched its plans for the Health Innovation Center to help Kentucky's future economy and health professions. What plans do you have to help us bring this important facility to life? Well, look, part of the problem of, of Kentucky is the, low, is the uh, inaccessibility of health care and medical care. And uh, there for a while, the University of Kentucky was being paid not to graduate doctors and so, uh, to, or to keep the amount scarce. What we say is we ought to be doubling the number of doctors that are produced in this state. We ought to be tripling and quadrupling the number of physicians assistants and certified uh, nurses who can give shots and help make diagnosis and continue uh, health care. We ought to spread them all over the state by giving them some economic incentive to go out to these rural areas. So uh, I'm all for it, and it's time that we start spending money in that direction uh, rather than some of these, uh, uh, some of these uh, uh, buildings that are uh, tributes to, uh, uh, to uh, I don't know, <laughs> some of the cathedrals over in Europe, you know. Uh, so I'm, I'm very glad that uh, we're, you're looking, you got plans to establish a, a health training, uh, health education there at Northern Kentucky. Uh, I'd, I'd like to spread that kind of money around. Uh, and again, uh, that's something that will provide service to the people, not to allow our uh, university presidents to go around and hobnob with uh, big brain people who cost us big bucks for him to hobnob with. <laughs>
Kentucky polls, of course, are open at 6 a.m. and close at 6 p.m. on November 8th. Tom McKee, 9 News in Frankfurt.